Welcome to the Kips Personal Training Application Podcast. We have a good episode for you now. We have Vincent Mezzo, the Dean of Personal Training at the Swedish Institute in New York City, and also the Director of Education for Kettlebell Concepts. With kettlebells these days in the industry, you see them utilized with swings, squats, presses, cleans, snatches. With all of these items though, where do you begin? Where do you start with the client? How do you introduce them? to a client. These are all items that we're going to talk about in this episode and really focus on the fundamentals. So let's jump into it. Hello and welcome to the KIPS Personal Training Application Podcast. My name is Tyler Valencia and I'm the president of KIPS and Kettlebell Concepts. Today we have a great guest with us, Vincent Mezzo. He is the Dean of Personal Training at the Swedish Institute in New York City and also the Director of Education for Kettlebell Concepts. So before we go any further, Vince, how are you doing? I'm doing great today, Tyler. Thanks for having me here. Of course, of course. And before we even jump into the application part, Vince, can you give us a little background on yourself, educational, and kind of the path in terms of how you got to where you are? Sure. I used to think my path was pretty unique, but as I've been in the fitness industry for more than 20 years, I meet more and more people who have a similar pathway. And that pathway actually comes from the arts. So I started out as a performer and a dancer, and I was doing a very physical type of theater. It was based on the work of a man named Jerzy Grotowski, and basically Grotowski wrote a book called Towards a Poor Theater. And the idea was that the actor needed to use their body to be the sets and the costume and the character and everything. And so while I was studying that type of theater, and different types of stuff from the Iowa Theater Lab, which was all very physically based and oriented, I got interested in acrobatics. And I say acrobatics instead of gymnastics because we didn't do any apparatus work. Everything we did was really for the stage. It was you know, for performance stuff you could just do on a wood floor any place. And I studied acrobatics for about 10 years. And while I was doing that, I started to have a lot of wear and tear on my body. So I started getting massage therapy. And then the person I got massage therapy from, who was an athletic trainer and an exercise physiologist, she said, hey, you want to go lift weights? And I was like, what, you mean like pump iron? <laughs> Dancers don't do that. that. That's crazy talk. And she was like, no, really, it'll help you. You know, when I had come up as a dancer, dancers didn't lift weights. It was, you know, the same thing that we hear about, you know, it's going to slow my athletes down. It's going to make them muscle bound, all of that kind of stuff. You still sometimes hear from coaches that was very prevalent in the dance world. So... I trusted this woman. Her name is Taj Jahara. She's an athletic trainer and a uh, personal trainer and exercise physiologist. And so I started going to the gym and lifting. And we did a lot of Pilates-based work as well. And we did a lot of handstand push-ups and pull-ups and body weight work, along with more traditional weightlifting. And I started to realize, wow, I'm holding my handstands longer, I'm picking up more tricks, I'm picking up tricks more quickly, I'm not as wrecked between classes. There's something to this. So basically, I came up with a five-year plan, and I decided to go back to NYU, where I'd gotten my drama degree, and get a degree in exercise physiology and fitness management, and then to go to the Swedish Institute, where I ended up teaching, and get a massage therapy license. So basically, it has been a journey of self-discovery, which ended up leading to a career in the fitness field. You touched on a couple of things that I want to go back to that uh, kind of triggered my mind there. And while this podcast is going to be more on the application base, I think that you hit on something that as we evolve as an industry, as more information comes out involving exercise science, more research, you know, hopefully the minds of coaches, of individuals, you know, changes as well. Because 
the information is out there and it's really just educating as well. I, I remember when I used to own a, a boot camp and an elder gentleman uh, who came usually at the same time, he walked his dog around the park. It was an outdoor boot camp. And he talked about how uh-huh. he, when he, he actually, before the war, um, he was a professional baseball player. I think it was for the Oakland athletics. And he was talking about how mm-hmm. he was like, wow, you know what you guys are doing is so great. You know, I wish that we had this type of training when I was a baseball player. And he's like, you know, we didn't believe in strength training. You know, we, we smoked cigarettes. We went out and, you know, drank after games mm-hmm. and we didn't take care of our bodies. And he's like, I can see how, you know, it's affecting me now. And so, you know, that type of, uh, you know, he basically just reiterated how that information wasn't as widely accepted as it is now. So many people have different paths in the industry and even, um, you know, they get to a point where, you know, they're giving back. And so um, it's always interesting to hear how someone got into the industry. But as I said, today we're going to be talking about application and specifically kettlebells and introducing them to the client. So um, in my opinion, and this is something that I've actually spoken at in a handful of conferences this uh, past year in 2019, um, I talked about how the kettlebell can be a great introduction to unconventional items to clients or even uh, just showing them that it's not just barbells, it's not just um, uh, dumbbells, that there's other things out there. And specifically, uh, for our topic in this podcast with the kettlebell, it's something that can you know have benefits for them. You know, it might be foreign to them. And uh, Vince, what in your opinion, what kind of uh, benefits do you see for like pro- program design uh, compared to the dumbbell or barbell? Well, there's overall the kettlebell is not magic. So anything you can do with a barbell or a dumbbell, you can pretty much do with a kettlebell. And the main limitation is in the weight. You know, the reason you use a barbell is because you want to put 300 mm-hmm. pounds on the barbell. That's mm-hmm. what it's made for. But in terms of movements, whether it's clean, jerk, snatch, etc., those explosive movements are much easier to perform with the kettlebell than they are with the barbell or even with a dumbbell. And one of the main places that plays out is in the wrist and forearm. You know, when somebody tries to learn how to rack a barbell on their chest, you know, the first thing you hear, especially with older people is, and, you know, by older, I mean anybody in their 20s, is mm-hmm. oh this hurts my wrists oh i can't do it oh my wrists don't go that way and that's exacerbated by you know these nba and nfl stars who are in these ridiculous commercials for a gatorade <laughs> or whatever and then the, there they are wearing lifting gloves cleaning you know some little less mills <laughs> barbell and it's like god that isn't even a proper rack who who even taught you how to do that So the kettlebell really gives us the ability to do those movements in a way that's much more kind to the wrists and easier to learn. But I think there's sort of a bigger overall picture there, which is, you know, getting back to what I was saying about people thinking the weightlifting made you muscle bound and things like that. The other side of that was when I started in the fitness industry, it was very much a machine-based Nautilus selectorized equipment. Oh, squats are a controversial (laughs) exercise. I mean, literally back in the early nineties, that's what, you know, Ace was saying, oh, squats are a controversial exercise. Forget about deadlifts, forget about cleans and jerks or things like that. It was just a very constrained environment. Hyperextensions, supermans, oh my God, are you really doing that? That's contraindicated. And nobody really had the education to look at, or at least, you know, in the general fitness industry, your average personal trainer didn't have the education to look at that and say, wait, this Mm -hmm. is on a case by case basis. Not everybody is so enfeebled that a squat is a controversial exercise. So the other aspect of the kettlebell, especially because of my dance background, is all of a sudden 
it was so freeing in terms of range of motion, yeah. plane of motion, and the dynamic nature of the exercises. Not just the explosive nature if we're doing cleans, jerks, and snatches, but the swing and high pulls and all of these movements, which are suddenly done in a fluid, velocity-based dynamic environment, really helps people yeah. move and better. I, something to go back on that has become... I'll say common knowledge almost, and I I love hearing it is how individualization, whether it's strength training, nutrition, um, any aspect of training, is always recommended. You know, these are things that for the last ten years I feel like educational companies have been almost fighting for to tell people that no, you got to in, individualize for the person. You know, there can be a little leeway here and there. Um, depending upon what the scenario is, but if you want the client to get the best outcome, you've got to you know look at their health history, look at their um, you know their current status, and you know the, something that popped in my hand, and the only reason that I know this was I talked about it in a presentation was about twenty five percent of individuals over the age of fifty have shoulder pain. So when we think about a quarter of the population having uh, health, um, you know, unhealthy shoulders. Here is an item that we can utilize with them to alter range of motion a little bit easier or even change um, the plane of, of motion for them. And that's something as myself, when I was doing more training, I would typically uh, set up clients in more of either the scapular plane or something a little more sagittal in order to uh, change the range of motion, but also hopefully alleviate some of that pain in their shoulder. And so when we think about these types of modifications for clients, those are things that uh, as a trainer, we're individualizing it for them or even teaching them safer mechanics in order to be more successful long term. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, you know, the other side of that is also uh, the first step in that is actually doing an assessment. And I think it's become a, um, you know, oh, they just want to work out. They just want to have fun. They just want to get their sweat on. And it's like, yeah, well, I appreciate the boot camps and small group training is popular these days, but that still doesn't mean that you as a trainer are not responsible for actually knowing what you're doing. You know, don't just look at the person and say, oh, you have overactive hip flexors if you haven't performed the Thomas test, you know, you actually need to be able to do assessments and be able to connect them to the benefits for the client. Maybe people think that too much education results in just talking about features and advantages and not being able to make those benefit statements. But the biggest benefit is when you do the assessments and then can tailor the exercise. Yeah. What is... Um, an assessment that you recommend for overhead pressing. Do you have anything that uh, you your go to? There are. I've done a number of workshops, like unraveling the overhead squat or unwinding the overhead squat. I do a lot of shoulder workshops, and we have the uh, corrective strategies and techniques course on the Kips website now. So. I typically don't like to just do one assessment, but at a certain point, any exercise that the client does is an assessment. So if you observe them doing a press, that gives you some information. You observe them doing a push up or a bent over row. You have them do a wall angel. There are all sorts of different things that are exercises, but are also assessments and then you can get more specifically depending on your level of training staying within your scope of practice of looking at specific muscle length tests special tests impingement tests load and shift tests things like that yeah and even uh, you know going back to the daily assessment and you know those things might change depending upon you know how that client woke up that day you know, did they sleep wrong on their Absolutely. shoulder? Or did they have a stressful weekend? Did they, you know, have some type of physical activity recently that changed their range of motion or, you know, their energy level? Those are the things that as a trainer, you know, we need to 
process them and be able to modify our program and not just be so rigid with, no, you did this week, last week, you got to do it this, this week as well. Right. You definitely need to be able to stay flexible and change the plan when they come in and you see how they are. So you've got their goals, you've got their needs, Mm -hmm. you've got the plan, but then you've also got where they're at that particular day that you need to take into account. And all of those things are going to help you modify, help you choose perhaps different exercises whether it's time to progress or regress on that day as well yeah. and you know with um you know getting into overhead movements and as people that are most likely listening to this podcast they will notice that on kips we have a handful of courses that have to do with um you know the steel mace clubs and you know getting to those movements is also you know, part of knowing your client, are they physically ready to perform these movements? Um, do you have some exercises that you recommend? And then, you know, specifically, you know, I was watching one of your YouTube videos on the Kettlebell Concepts YouTube channel, and I saw some great ones. And would you mind going over, some, you know, the ribbon and the halo and kind of why you like sure. those? Sure. The you know, mobilizing the shoulder joint complex, but also mobilizing the thoracic spine before somebody does overhead movements, whether it's as a warm up or whether it's as part of an assessment is incredibly important. So warm up is literally warming up the body. So I like to keep most of my warm ups, especially my kettlebell specific warm ups, start off with stuff that's below the shoulder. So we do swings, we do pulls, but basically we're keeping the kettlebell below the height of the shoulder. And after a number of different repetitions, the person starts to break a sweat. Before we do any overhead pressing, we start to add in ribbons, where basically you're bringing the kettlebell in the bottoms up by the horn position from the hip up around the head and really holding it pointing down between the shoulder blades. It's not just like uh, going over your hair, not to, you know, muss up your hair, but literally trying to keep that kettlebell as close to your body as you can and really having the weight of the kettlebell pull your arms back so that the kettlebell ends up between the shoulder blades. The elbows are fully flexed and the shoulders are fully flexed because the elbows are pointing up to the ceiling. And what's really great about that, you know, there was this study that was presented at ACSM uh, back in the early 2000s. And basically they took two groups of people and one group did just resistance training and the other group did just passive stretching. And at the end of six weeks, both groups improved their flexibility the same amount, their range of motion the same amount. So the idea that you only have to stretch, do corrective stretches to improve range of motion I I think is a very short-sighted idea. And it's actually those dynamic movements, things like the halo and the uh, ribbon that can really help to improve range of motion. And then also, just because the person doesn't have full range of motion, as long as they're pain-free, overhead pressing is actually a great way to improve range of motion. You know, it's like the specificity principle. How are you going to improve your range of motion overhead if you don't actually move your arm overhead? And that having the resistance there then activates the Golgi tendon organs and does all of this other stuff that's really like tense and release, relax, and there's some reciprocal inhibition there. So actually getting the person to move in the sagittal plane, in the plane of the scapula, in a way that's safe and pain-free, monitoring the volume so that you don't overdo it, are really some of the best ways to improve their range of motion and get them to be able to do more of that overhead work. And while these are overhead movements and exercises to help mobilize our overhead mechanics, a part of this that I actually enjoy myself and even, you know, try to emphasize with clients is how is the spine in those in these movements with the mm-hmm. overhead presses, 
halos, ribbons. These are movements where if someone's core is weak, we're going to see them break or we'll go into extension, flexion, whatever that might be, depending upon the individual in these movements. So we can actually cue them and teach them how to maintain that tight core or that neutral spine throughout these movements. So when we do load it up, they can still maintain that and build a stronger core in an overhead position. So that's something that we usually maybe not include in when we teach these. Hopefully we include them, but I think that's another visual thing and a great cue to emphasize with our clients right there. Yeah, it's. I think people tend to look at the spine as just one thing instead of really breaking it into lumbar and thoracic segments. And so, yeah, you want stability in the lumbar spine. And when somebody's moving overhead, you don't want excessive movement in the lumbar spine, although obviously some movement is allowed. But the other limitation that so many people have is they don't have enough thoracic extension. And so being able to mobilize the rib cage, mobilize the thoracic spine, as well as help to stabilize the thoracic spine and the lower ribs with the upper abdominal muscles. You know, that's a whole thing about holding a handstand. Uh, there are two different type, basically two main categories of handstands. There's the more sort of circus arched back handstand. And then there's the very straight gymnastics power tumbling handstand, which really requires a lot of pulling in and compressing of the lower ribs with the upper abdominal muscles. So it's interesting how we need both stabilization as well as the ability to extend the thoracic spine to be able to allow the scapula to move freely and therefore the rest of the shoulder girdle to move freely or the shoulder joint complex to move freely. That's great stuff right there. I love that kind of stuff. Um, right now, I actually want to get to our podcast takeaway. So in this section, I'm kind of going to let you take away. And if you can, Vince, go take us through maybe two extra, two, three exercises that you really feel are fundamentals for kettlebells and introducing them to the clients. Sure. The, the first thing, you know, it, it's easy to say, oh, you have to focus on fundamentals, but you know, there's a reason fundamentals are fundamentals. And one of the things that needs to be emphasized so much is the rack position. So there are five points to the kettlebell rack position. The handle needs to be diagonally across the palm from the web of the thumb to the pisiform bone, which is that big uh, bulbous bone uh, on the pinky side of the heel of your hand. I'm sure, I mean, we're talking to trainers here, so I'm sure they know where that is. But that handle needs to be diagonal across the palm. And if that handle is diagonal across the palm, then the wrist can be straight. The thumb points back towards the sternum, so you want to keep the kettlebell really close to your body in the rack position. Kettlebell is part on the forearm, part on the bicep, and then the elbow is in. But that straight wrist position and having the thumb pointing towards your chest, towards your sternum, towards your clavicle there is really paramount to anything you're going to do overhead. Because as soon as that wrist extends, as soon as you don't have that proper rack position and the wrist extends, now when you push the kettlebell up overhead, you've got this axis for rotation of your shoulder. So you've totally destabilized your shoulder by flexing your wrist and creating this other lever arm and an axis for rotation. Whereas if you have the proper rack position, then when you press overhead, your wrist is straight and you don't have that extra axis for rotation. So we have the thumb back, the wrist straight in the rack position, and then with the kettlebell, as with a push press or a jerk with a barbell from the rack position, what you want to do is you want to move through the sagittal plane. So that elbow is going to come forward, point forward, and go all the way up overhead. And in the lockout position, that overhead position, the thumb is back. The wrist is still straight, that handle is still diagonal, the elbow's straight, 
and the bicep is in line with or behind the ear and the shoulder blade should be pulling down. So you want to try and depress the shoulder blade there. Now, once you're in this position, you know, you can do overhead squats, you can do all sorts of things, but then you want to keep that position alive. It's not just push it overhead and forget about it as the elbow starts to bend and the arm falls out of perpendicular to the floor. If you start to do an overhead squat or something like that, you need to think about that kettlebell moving up towards the ceiling. Then the last thing I would say, even though we have a lot of almost internal cues here, is really to focus on the external cueing, the goal of the movement, and the distance, direction, and description. So when we talk about pushing up to the ceiling, keep the kettlebell lifting towards the ceiling while you're bending your knees and squatting downward. Having the person really be involved in what the goal of the movement is as opposed to putting them inside their body and saying things like squeeze your shoulder blades together or squeeze your glutes or things like that, but have them think about how they're affecting the external environment. That's going to help their motor control system tap into the correct muscles to be able to effectively do the movement and therefore get the most benefit from the movement. So distance, direction, and description, I think, are a very important takeaway in terms of how you cue. There's what you want to see, but then there's also how you're going to tell the client to do it. And that should be external cueing and distance, direction, and description. Great stuff right there. And, you know, with this breakdown, I think you really hit on even just how you introduced it. I'll say with the rack, you're not going overhead, but getting a solid rack position is going to lead to so many other things. Oftentimes with exercise selection or even performing exercise, we want to get to the good stuff. We want to get to the outcomes, the types of um, fancy stuff we see on social media, but we miss the fundamentals. We miss the, you know, the basics that are so crucial for setting up certain exercises. And if we can't hit those points, you know, this could lead to injury. This could lead to things that we don't want with our clients. Yeah. And you can't, you can't train as hard as you need to, to get to your goals. If you're doing things that are inefficient, exactly. You no, know, that rack position is done in a certain way because that's the most efficient way to do it. Yes. And if you're not being efficient, how can you do the amount of work that you need in order to ultimately achieve your goals? Yes. Yes. So what else you got for us with the takeaways? Well, The idea of external cueing, I think, is very important. The idea that the actual kettlebell exercises themselves can be corrective in nature if you are thinking about what the goal is and what the range of motion and plane of motion are that you want the person to be moving through. Starting in the rack, getting a good solid rack, getting a good solid lockout position, and really having the person appreciate the idea that it's their job to make it easy, and it's your job as the trainer to make it hard. So what they need to be showing you is that, yeah, I can do this. I got more in the tank. And once they show you that they can do it officially and have more in the tank, then that lets you as the trainer know that it's time to progress them. But if they're just struggling through and looking sloppy, then they're not really where they need to be to do the amount of work they need to to attain their goals. And I think, uh, you know, a last thing is that if it looks good, it is good. (laughs) Passing the visual test there. Yeah, exactly. You know, it it should look good. They should look efficient. They should look competent. And if they look efficient and look competent, then clearly they've done their job. If they look like they're struggling and confused, then clearly there's something wrong there. Even if they can do 15 reps, if they look confused and troubled doing them, then we need to go back to the drawing board and really work on those fundamentals and remind them, no, you should be making this look easy, right? If you're struggling that much, uh, I'm a little concerned for you. No, I think you you hit on it earlier too with the um, increased popularity of certain types of high intensity exercise and 
um, I'll say the mindset of the typical client that comes in these days that they believe that they need to be in pain leaving a session and, you know, a trainer that is educated and, you know, knows that, no, if you are coming back more consistently, if you are able to walk after the session, that's a good thing. If, if you are in, are in pain or on the point of, you know, physical exhaustion, why are you going to want to come back? And especially talking, you know, as the time that we're filming this or recording this podcast at the start of a, a new year, you know, this is the time when you see clients that are looking for change. They're looking to make some type of healthier lifestyle change. And if we're teaching them the, that, you know, you need to be drenched in sweat before you leave the gym, then what are we doing? What are we doing as an industry, as trainers, and how are we setting them up for success if that's the type of mindset we are educating them on? But if we take the time to, you know, show them either deficiencies that we want to work on with them or why it's going to take a certain amount of time. And, you know, this also goes back to, I'll say, a society issue as well with we want things much sooner. We want results much, much quicker. But if we educate them on why it's going to take a certain amount of time or why are we going to take things a little bit slower, hopefully a client can walk away with an understanding that we're doing this for them, that we want them to be able to live a healthier lifestyle and be able to exercise longer and not just fall off after, you know, two, three months. Yeah, it's very much the idea of long-term lifestyle yeah. change. And we hear about that a lot when it comes to healthful eating habits or diet. And you don't want to go on a diet. You want to establish long-term healthful yeah. habits. There aren't good foods and bad foods. There are foods and you need to figure out how you're going to develop habits that can sustain you in a healthful way for the long term at the weight and the functional capacity that you want to be at. So I think in some cases, people have gotten their minds around that. I don't think yeah. they like it. And I think a lot of people are still in denial about it. But certainly in that part of the industry, we hear about that more. And then as an educator, a lot of times I'll talk to students who've failed a test and they're like, oh, but I studied so hard. Okay, but do you really want to be studying mm -hmm. hard or do you want to be studying smart? And when they understand that the way the brain works and all the background neuroplasticity and synapses forming and the repetition that's needed. And they start to realize that studying for five hours the night before a test where you're sweating and miserable and really studying hard isn't as effective as studying for 45 minutes a day, maybe 45 minutes twice a day. And the more time and the more consistency that you have with that material and the more repetition over time that you have material, that's actually studying smart. And that's what leads to long-term learning or learning and putting things into long-term memory. If people could apply that to fitness, then I think they'd be in a lot better position to foster long-term lifestyle change and long-term physiological and anatomical change in their bodies. Because going to the gym once and hitting it real hard doesn't make up for the last six years when you didn't go to the gym and the next month that you're not going to go to the gym because you're so sore that you're afraid to walk back in there and you're having trouble going up and down stairs. You know, it's really the tortoise and the hare. Slow and steady gets it done. And what slow is really depends on where you are. You know, the, that T-shirt that's out there, uh, your workout is my warm-up. Yeah, that's true. You know, just because you start off slow, that doesn't mean that what is slow for you remains yeah. the same. You know, it doesn't mean that you can't eventually get up to larger volumes, higher intensities of exercise, but it all really needs to be relative to where you are. Right? You can't just go into trigonometry if you don't know addition. 
and you can get a good workout with addition just the same way you can with trigonometry but you need to go through addition and geometry and algebra before you get to trig so you need to think about your exercise very much in the same way that this is a process and if people took more of a martial arts approach to it more of a yoga approach to it that you know might put them in a better state of mind for long-term adherence to their exercise program and better health outcomes but until we see research that throwing up is definitely the mark of a better workout then uh i'm gonna go for slow and steady gets it done and work smart don't work hard <laughs> and uh it's funny that you mentioned that literally in the last 12 hours i watched a clip from um i'll say a local um gym chain in my, where I live that they went on a, a news channel and they were promoting even shorter, higher intensity workouts. And you know what we're talking about is the long game, which often people do not want to get into, but it's just as beneficial or it is more beneficial. And what we're looking for, you know, with coming back to everything we discussed in this podcast, talked about the fundamentals of the rack position and why setting this up is going to lead to better mechanics, better workouts, or better uh, exercises utilizing the rack position, but even the individualization of certain exercises for overhead movements. I think that's a, a big theme of this podcast that we had today was looking at the client, where are they in terms of health history? Uh, where can we take the programming for them involving the kettlebell and overhead mechanics? But even the mental aspect of it, which uh, despite other podcasts that I've done that have to do with working out in general, whether it's hit or um, other topics, this is something that comes up a lot is the mental aspect of training. And I remember when I used to work for an education company, um, a different education company, um, that was something that I remember we added into the entry level personal training ma manual because it was a topic that needs to be in there um, based off of um, some research that was performed um, with subject matter experts. We added in an exercise psychology chapter because it was something that needed to be a part of um, a, a entry manual and not just a side topic anymore. You know, not just, you know, a paragraph here or there in one of the chapters and needed its full section on it. And so um, the reason why you know, I'm talking about it now is that uh, this is an area that trainers can and should start to look into more with their clients. And I think often as we're talking about the you know, more intense spectrums of the industry, you know, we're talking about um, you know, clients that are puking or that are um, on the verge of exhaustion, uh, the mental aspect of if we're pushing them to that limit, you know, what are we doing for them and that? And so being able to empathize and understand the client is going to be able to overall improve our, our programming as as trainers. Yeah, absolutely. The motivation and goal setting aspects to personal training are huge. And then the behavior modification aspects of it are huge. And we really have a lot of great tools you know we used to talk about contracting and checking in and giving clients homework and now we have these amazing tools like the fitbit and these other fitness trackers that really allow us to if we understand the psychology the health psychology the psychology of motivation and goal setting of how to monitor clients in a way that's easy for us really efficient and effective and can ultimately lead to better outcomes. But I think a lot of people in the fitness industry look at the technology as a competition as opposed to looking at it as something that can help them better serve their clients. And also, you know, the people who are making the Fitbits and stuff are not always, you know, they're technicians, so they're not really understanding how is it that the client and the trainer are going to interface through this device and through this information, and how can we really facilitate that interaction as opposed to 
trying to make the Fitbit and everything some sort of online, impersonal type of thing that's, you know, based on an algorithm and pretends to be personal, but really isn't an actual person on the other side of the Fitbit. And what we need to do is be able to use the Fitbit as a link between us and our clients for that other 23 hours in the day when we're not actually with our client. Yeah. It's a very good point there. Very good point. And so I to kind of wrap this up, um, and I'm actually hoping that we make an additional one. I know that in this one, we focused on overhead mechanics and movements, but I think there's just so much more that when we're introducing the kettlebell to our client that we can dive into. And so um, I think that uh, we'll work on a second episode or even a third one. Yeah, that sounds great. There's plenty of stuff that we can unpack with the kettlebell and with motivation and goal setting and cueing and all sorts of other aspects. Definitely, definitely. So Vince, can you give uh, the listeners, you know, kind of where they can find you online, social media, and then potentially any upcoming workshops? Absolutely. I'm on Facebook as lowtechhigheffect.com. Also as Kettlebell Boot Camp NYC and Indian Clubs 101. Those are all Facebook and Instagram. And we have some upcoming live workshops in New York City. We're doing a Kettlebell Level 1 and Indian Club 101 training. And also a Kettlebell Level 2 in January and February of this year in New York City. That's correct. And you can find those ones with kettlebellconcepts.com. Um, the level two, I believe, is the third weekend of February. And then the level one is that last weekend, uh, first day of March in 2020. So great stuff right there. If you want to get more with the kettlebell, if you're looking for a new certification, make sure to check those out. Vince, thank you for coming on. And uh, we'll definitely be having you back for another episode. Awesome. Thanks very much, Tyler.